Welcome to Pages with the Principal. We are on chapter two or route two, it's called Pay the Bill. The trouble really started six months back during those weird three weeks of school between Thanksgiving and winter break. Scoob's got no idea why, but over the course of that stretch, Bryce Benedict, a kid Scoob used to be friends with until he started playing footy ball and got too big for his britches, grandma likes to say, started picking on Shanice's little brother, Drake. Drake has epilepsy, which was never a big deal until Bryce's antics began. Things started pretty light. Bryce would make unnecessary detours past Scoob, Shanice, and Drake's table in the cafeteria to tap Drake on the back of his head as he shouted, Sup, Drakey Drake, loud enough for the whole room to hear. After a few days of this, the tapping turned to shoving, turned to smacking. There was one morning Bryce hit so hard, Drake cried out in pain. The nearest teacher hadn't been paying attention. If she had been, Bryce probably wouldn't have done it. But when she turned to see what had happened, Bryce was gone and Drake said nothing. So no one else said anything either. The following day, Bryce cornered Drake in the hallway to taunt him. Scoob arrived just after Drake's arm jerked off their own accord and he dropped all the books he was holding. Of course, old Bryce found this and Shanice's protective punch in the chest hilarious. He sh shoved Drake's shoulder hard and walked off just as Scoob rushed over to help Shanice and Drake with the books. As they gathered everything, Scoob could tell Drake was fighting with everything he had to keep from crying. Shanice was crying. For the first time in his life, Scoob experienced a violent urge. He wanted to smack Bryce upside his fat head. Whew, Grandma says as Scoob relays the story to her over an early dinner. They're at a place called Damn Yankees and the lemon pepper wings truly are smoking, just like the menu says. Decor is a bit country rodeo posters and horseshoes and cowboy hats all over the walls, lassos and saddles hanging from the ceiling. There's even a mounted bull's head, massive horns, menacingly outstretched. Can't blame you, Scooba-Doo, Grandma continues. Scoob sighs, grateful some grown-up in his life seemed to understand. I knew you'd get it, Grandma, because she always did. What Drake have to say, Grandma asked. He shrugged it off, said, he's just being a bully, which made me even madder. I bet, hard seeing someone you care about brush that kind of thing off, ain't it? Scoob nods, it really is. And as the day wore on, Bryce's taunting got more intense. One day after school, Shanice confided in Scoob that Drake hadn't been sleeping real well, that he'd been having bad dreams, and she was pretty sure they had to do with Bryce picking on him. That he'd been having more seizures despite taking his medicine like he was supposed to. That's when I started noticing that Drake would like blank out at random times, Scoob says to Grandma. There was even a day someone was talking to him at the lunch table and he didn't respond, just sat staring straight ahead. People had looked around at each other and started whispering and Drake sat perfectly still blinking, blinking, blinking. Bryce passed by and hit him, and Drake's whole body lurched forward like a board, which Bryce thought was hilarious. Scoob's, Scoob's eyes narrow as the anger begins to simmer again. He pointed one of his fat pink fingers at Drake and laughed. Imitate Drake's blinks. Looks like he's having one of his seizures, he said did air quotes and everything. Scoob shakes his head. Grandma shakes hers too. Then, he said, too bad it's not the type where he shakes and his tongue falls out. And he stuck his big ugly tongue out and pretended to convulse. Shanice jumped up and said something I won't repeat. And then Bryce looked at her like the evil villains do in the cartoons just before they hurt people. When he took a step toward her, I, Scoob sighs. I lost it, Grandma. Just kinda snapped. Scoob will never forget hearing Miss Manna Smith gasp as he leapt from his seat, hopped the table, and tackled Bryce. 
and then they were on the floor. Bryce on his back, Scoob on top of him, punching, punching, punching. Scoob's got no idea how long he punched. He just knows that at some point, one of the punches failed to connect because he was flying up, up, up. And by the time his surroundings came into focus, there was no longer a youngish white lady staring at him, but a little old brown skinned dude. Mr. Armand, the principal of Casey M. Weeks Magnet Middle School. Soon, that dude was joined by a big, slightly lighter brown skinned dude, Dr. James Robert Lamar Jr. Scoob's father. And that was the beginning of the end, Scoob says to Grandma as he rips another hunk of lemony pepper meat from a chicken leg. The end of what exactly? Grandma eating a raw oyster. Scoob shuts his eyes as she picks up a shell and tips the glob of gross into her new, into her now snaggletooth mouth. She removed her partial. The thought of the false teeth currently chilling in that purple glitter container Inside Grandma's purse almost grosses Scoob out as much as the oysters. Scoob shudders and takes a sip of sweet tea to clear his head. Sorry, what, what was the question? Grandma smiles. You said the fight with Bryce, the bonehead, was the beginning of the end. The end of what? Oh, Scoob says, lowering his eyes to his near empty plate. The end of, well, Dad's faith in me, I guess. Not that Dad would listen to Scoob when Scoob tried to explain why he did it. You think a police officer will care about you defending a friend when they toss you in jail for aggravated assault? Dad said on the way home from school to begin, Sco to begin Scoob's three-day suspension. You can't react violently to someone else's words, especially someone like Bryce. When boys like you, he pointed to the ba brown back of Scoob's hand, hit boys like him. He opened his own hand and pointed to his pale palm this punishment is harsher and the fallout infinitely worse, William. Scoob will never forget Dad's look of disappointment. Seems a tad extreme, don't you think? Grandma says, plucking Scoob back into the present. He shakes his head. Not really. He used to tell me he, he had faith in me all the time, but now he acts like I'm some hardened delinquent. It's like he thinks there's no hope for me or something. Won't even look me in the eye anymore especially since the other incident. The one with the computers? Yep. Grandma doesn't press further. Which Scoob is thankful for? He really doesn't want to get into that right now. He takes another swig of sweet tea to swallow the little ball that's risen in his throat. This is the first time he's spoken aloud about why dad's been, about, let me start that again. This is the first time he's spoken aloud about the way dad's been to him lately kind of makes him want to cry, but he won't. Though he can totally feel grandma looking at him and he knows from the way the hairs on the back of his neck are rising, she's doing that thing where she tries to see inside his head. If he looks at her now, she'll see all the other mess. Scoob's frustrations over the fact that Bryce wasn't punished, his annoyance that all the teachers look at him like he's a little stick of dynamite now, despite the fact that Bryce is still terrorizing people, though not Drake anymore. His anger over the unfairness of the whole situation swirling around behind Scoob's eyes and she'll drag it all out of him. But he doesn't want to tell her any of that. Right now, Scoob just wants to get back in Grandma's fancy new drivable home and go. Go and never look back. He pulls himself up straight and lifts his chin. That's when he notices an older white man in a baseball cap a few tables over looking between him and Grandma like they're some alien beings. Yeah, kids at school used to ask questions when they'd see Scoob and Grandma together. He's black and she's white, but this feels different. Less about curiosity and more disdainful. And that guy's not the only one. Bouncing his eyes around the room, Scoob realizes a bunch of people are looking at him and Grandma funny. One lady he makes eye contact with openly sneers at him, like he's done something wrong like he is something wrong even. It's the same way dad looked at him when he stepped into Mr. Armand's office for the first time after the fight. His hands tightened around his damp glass of tea, which he'd really like to pick up and lob at the woman. Give her a reason to look at him the way she is. Grandma's warm hand squeezes Scoob's 
other one, which is resting on the table in a fist. He locks his eyes with her and she smiles. His chest unclenches a little. What do you say we blow this popsicle stand, huh? She asks him. We've eaten our fill. Now time to eat, eat some road. Scoob nods and grins. Sounds disgusting, Grandma, but okay. As they, make, as they make their way outside, Grandma turns to him and says, These small towns are really something, aren't they? Bass ackwards, as your Jeep Grandpa used to say, but that's all right. She doesn't say anything else, and Sco Scoob doesn't respond. They pull away from the restaurant and it hits him. He's pretty sure Grandma didn't pay the bill. And that's all the time we have for today. Join us next time on Pages with the Principal as we continue reading our book, Clean Getaway. Thanks for joining us.